Having recognized this truth, I began to define means for carrying out my idea. And, after long thought, I finally conceived of a combination of apparatus which should make it possible the obtaining of power from the medium by a process of continuously cooling the atmospheric air. This apparatus, by continuously transforming heat into mechanical work, tended to become colder and colder. And, if it only were practicable to reach a very low temperature in this manner, then a sink for the heat could be produced, and energy could be derived from the medium. This seemed to be contrary to the statements of Carnot and Lord Kelvin before referred to, but I concluded from the theory of the process that such a result could be attained. This conclusion I reached, I think, in the latter part of 1883, when I was in Paris, and it was at a time when my mind was being more and more dominated by an invention which I had evolved during the preceding year, and which has since become known under the name of the rotating magnetic field. During the few years which followed, I elaborated further the plan I had imagined, and studied the working conditions, but made little headway. The commercial introduction in this country of the invention before referred to required most of my energies until 1889, when I again took up the idea of the self-acting machine. A closer investigation of the principles involved and calculation now showed that the result I aimed for could not be reached in a practical manner by ordinary machinery, as I had in the beginning expected. This led me, as a next step, to the study of a type of engine generally designated as turbine, which at first seemed to offer better chances for a realization of the idea. Soon I found, however, that the turbine too was unsuitable. But my conclusion showed that if an engine of a peculiar kind could be brought to a high degree of perfection, the plan I had conceived was realizable, and I resolved to proceed with the development of such an engine. The primary object of which was to secure the greatest economy of the transformation of heat into mechanical energy. A characteristic feature of the engine was that the work performing piston was not connected with anything else, but was perfectly free to vibrate at an enormous rate. The mechanical difficulties encountered in the construction of this engine were greater than I had anticipated, and I made slow progress. This work was continued until early in 1892, when I went to London, where I saw Professor Duar's admirable experiments with liquefied gases. Others had liquefied gases before, and notably Oslelsky and Pictet had performed creditable early experiments in this line. But there was such a figure about the work of Duar that even the old appeared new. His experiments showed, though in a different way from what I had imagined, that it was possible to reach a very low temperature by transforming heat into mechanical work. And I returned, deeply impressed with what I had seen, and more than ever convinced that my plan was practicable. The work, temporarily interrupted, was taken up new, and soon I had in a fair state of perfection the machine which I have named the mechanical oscillator. In this machine I succeeded in doing away with all packings, valves and lubrication, and in producing so rapid a vibration of the piston that the shafts of tough steel, fastened to the same and vibrated longitudinally, were torn asunder. By combining this engine with a dynamo of special design, I produced a highly efficient electrical generator, invaluable in measurements and determinations of physical quantities on account of an unvarying rate of oscillations obtainable by its means. I exhibited several types of this machine, named Mechanical and Electrical Oscillator, before the Electrical Congress at the World Fair in Chicago during the summer of 1893, in a lecture which, on account of other pressing work, I was unable to prepare for publication. On that occasion, I exposed the principles of the Mechanical Oscillator, but the original purpose of this machine is explained here for the first time. In the process as I had primarily conceived it, for the utilization of the energy of the ambient medium, there were five essential elements in combination, and each of these had to be newly designed and perfected, as no such machines existed. The mechanical oscillator was the first element of this combination. And having perfected this, I turned to the next, which was an air compressor of a design in certain respects resembling that of the mechanical oscillator. 
similar difficulties in the construction were again encountered, but the work was pushed vigorously and at the close of 1894 I had completed these two elements of the combination and thus produced an apparatus for compressing air virtually to any desired pressure, incomparably simpler, smaller and more efficient than the ordinary. I was just beginning to work on the third element, which together with the first two would give a refrigerating machine of exceptional efficiency and simplicity, when a misfortune befell me in the burning of my laboratory, which crippled my labours and delayed me. Shortly afterwards, Dr. Carl Linde announced the liquefaction of air by a self-cooling process, demonstrating that it was practicable to proceed with the cooling until liquefaction of the air took place. This was the only experimental proof which I was still wanting that energy was obtainable from the medium in a manner contemplated by me. This is where the description of the self-acting engine abruptly ends, or so it appears. But the description is actually now complete. All the elements have been presented and explained. We know that element 1 is an oscillator and element 2 is a compressor. What we need to make this a refrigerating machine is an expansion nozzle. Let's first examine the timeline. Tesla was researching X-rays, Lennart rays, cathode rays and vacuum tubes. But to use vacuum tubes with excessively high voltages poses a problem, which Tesla solved in 1896. So now we have a quote-unquote vacuum tube, which can be operated at any desired voltage. This is element 3, the expansion nozzle. Element 4 was briefly mentioned before. It is the work performing piston not connected with anything else. It transforms the high voltage generated and collected into vibrational energy which is pumped into the earth. And that is element number 5, the earth. When Tesla mentions Dr. Carl Linde, he is referring to regenerative cooling. In this process, the output of one cycle is used to precondition the input for the next cycle. In the self-acting engine, Tesla does something similar. He sends one pulse into the earth, and when the echo returns, it is received in his coils, amplified and sent back into the earth. Thus, he builds up an ever stronger pulse, or standing wave, inside the earth. As this wave gets stronger, the received signal gets stronger and the voltages in his coils rise. He derives more energy from the medium and delivers more power into the next pulse. This continues to the point where he derives sufficient energy from the medium to maintain this process, and thus he has created a self-acting engine.